Should I start now, Ashley? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's start. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the 13th edition of e-dialogue series organized by Urban Update, All India Institute of Local Self-Government and UCLG ASPAC. Today we are going to discuss an extremely important issue of disaster and cities, mitigation and resilience. Practically every city in India, and for that matter, across the world is facing the question today, how to make themselves more resilient and mitigate the suffering in the face of uh, a disaster. The point is there are uh, things science can predict. It can predict a hurricane or a cyclone, its wind speed, its direction, and when it is going to make a landfall. But what it cannot predict is a pandemic, an earthquake, or a flood. These natural hazards have increasingly imposed risks to human lives and the well being of communities. Therefore, it becomes imperative that for a disaster risk management and climate change globally, urban planning is a major factor that needs to be reconsidered. The disaster risk is expected to grow substantially as climate change increases the frequency and intensity of the natural hazards. Uh, it throws many questions and we will take them one by one today. Joining me today is a power packed panel. I will not go into detailed, uh, detailed profile of theirs because then it will consume the entire duration of the program. But briefly, joining us from Bangkok is Dr. Animesh Kumar, Deputy Head of United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, Asia and Pacific. Dr. Prabodh Dhar Chakravarti, Lead International Consultant, UNDP, UNESCAP, and World, World Bank. He is joining us from New Delhi. Dr. Virupaksha Dekshit, India coordinator, practical action. He is joining us from Bhuvaneshwar. Mr. Leo Saldanha, he is a trustee of Environmental Support Group. He is joining us from Bengaluru. And Mr. Mihir Arbhat, director, All India Disaster Management Institute. He is joining us from Ahmedabad. So let's first straight go to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Animesh Kumar, Deputy Head, UNDRR. Animesh, uh, you advise government, intergovernmental uh, organizations on disaster risk reduction. Uh, I was going through a figure of uh, and a document of uh, United Nations Social and Economic uh, Affairs. And it says that close to three out of five cities worldwide with at least five lakh inhabitants are at high risk of natural disaster. In other words, it will affect world 1.4 billion people worldwide. Add it to the man-made disaster. In your view, how alarming is the situation? And if I talk about uh, in the particular context of India, what is your assessment of the preparedness of Indian cities, how resi resilient they are, and how prepared they are to mitigate the effects in case of a disaster. 
Animesh. Thanks, Mr. Dhananjay. Thanks for inviting me to this webinar. And I think cities are becoming the hub of activities, the mirror economic growth. And in most countries, as we move forward, I mean, we know already that more, more number of people now live in the urban areas in the world than in the rural areas. And this figure will only increase to two third by 2050. So the, this dichotomy between urban and rural areas is increasingly becoming cosmetic and we'll have to have a more holistic approach to ensuring that the development processes take risk into account. What I would do uh, maybe is to open up the discussion to talk a bit about what the question you posed in context of some of the key emerging challenges that we are seeing uh, in different cities in the world, but more focusing now in South Asia and in India. Um, and when we talk about disaster risk, it's very important to understand and uh, appreciate the fact that disaster and hazards are not the same. I mean, when we try to often equate the two, Disaster is also a function of vulnerability. It's also a function of the societal capacity. And then all of it comes together at scales and systems. So not going into the details of it, let me try to put together the hazard aspect, aspect of disaster risks in India and South Asian cities and the vulnerability aspect. How does that exacerbate the impact of disasters further? In terms of uh, the increasing intensity of disasters itself, we are seeing already that uh, the the frequency, the impact and intensity of disasters is increasing every passing day. And without taking into account the climatic impacts, which I'll come to very, very quickly, but just look at earthquakes, for example. I know that NDMA that did a very uh, comprehensive analysis of Indian cities of around 50 towns and districts in the country. And they found that out of 50 cities that they surveyed over a very long duration of time, 13 of them were at a very high risk of earthquakes. And at the same time, we also know the unplanned urbanization, the growth and spurt of infrastructure in the cities puts the inhabitant of these cities at very high risk of uh, mortality and economic losses. Floods are becoming the most frequent of disasters and urban floods are increasingly becoming common. And when we talk about floods in cities, we need to understand again that hazards play a very small role in uh, enhancing the impact of floods in the cities. It's more to do how we do solid waste management, for example, which is causing the floods in most of the cities and not necessarily an increase in the rainfall as the only reason why disasters are happening. Cyclones are becoming increasingly tropical cyclones. We have seen Amphan this year on the east and cyclone Nisarg in the west they are becoming very common. This year alone, we have seen a series of tropical cyclones while COVID was happening. So the impact of natural hazard into, when they turn into disaster is increasingly being felt in the cities. Now let me bring in the impact of the climate change. The increasing frequency of extreme events is something that is coming up so impactfully in different cities. If we look at the IPCC report of 2018 end, and they talk about how just a half a degree increase in temperatures and global warming will have such multiplier impact across the world. And this impact will be felt across cities more prominently because of the high density of population. For example, a change in temperature from 1.5 to 2 degree would mean 420 additional million people would face the impact of heat waves. And the impact of heat waves is much more in the cities and Perhaps that's one topic maybe the panel can discuss a bit more in detail because India is at very well placed to address because of some good practices which are also happening in, in India on heat waves. Another problem that is coming up, which is a, a kind of a coming together of climatic issues, but also non-climatic and human induced issues is air pollution. We know that India ranks among the top five most polluted countries in the world. But if we look at the top 30 polluted cities in the world, 21 of them are in India. And this is based on the air quality index. Pollution is itself becoming a huge issue in most of the urban parts of the country. And if we look at the impact of COVID, there is some positive news here, actually. The global warming, the impact of climate change, and the emission of carbon dioxide has declined from by around 10% from 2020 to 2019. And this is a slight opportunity that we need to harness because uh, of the, the impact in, in terms of the transportation, the industries are shut down. So as of now, the impact is declining and we need to see how best we can move forward from here so that the air pollution elements can be tackled as much as possible. 
Now, moving on to the vulnerability elements, it's becoming so common in Indian cities and, and not, it's not certainly limited to Indian cities, but across South Asian in terms of the rapid and unplanned urbanization. Most of the cities are growing not because of the rapid growth of population in the urban city, but also because of huge flux of population from the rural areas into the urban centers and from small towns to the bigger streams. So the migration happens in these streams of, uh, uh, of movements and the rural uh, areas are increasingly becoming big enough that they are being classified as towns, as in some cases census towns, just because they have become too big. But the governance process has remained very rural. So this poses a huge challenge for the inhabitants, both in terms of the impact that they face, but also in terms of the economic losses they would face because of the growing impact of disasters. Urban poverty and inequality is exacerbating the impact on specific set of populations within the cities. And overall, if we look at the rural urban interdependency, the impact on the food security of the urban areas is also becoming a challenge. So putting all of it together, and then we look at the way disasters have progressed and the way COVID has progressed in this year alone, the dual impact of COVID as a systemic manifestation of a series of things which are wrong in our society and compare it with a natural hazard induced disasters. I think we, it's an awakening time for all of us to ensure that we do certain things right at this point of time. So the societies don't keep getting impacted because of the spate of disasters that we are seeing. And this will be a problem because of the reducing fiscal space that the local authorities will be facing because of the increasing expenditures because of COVID and declining revenues, which is another challenge that will impact several developmental uh, efforts. So I think with these some initial points on bringing together the natural hazard, the technological hazard, the biological hazard with an element of vulnerabilities across cities and all of it backed by and underscored by poor planning and unplanned and rapid growth of population in many of the cities. I think I'll, I would stop here and maybe I'll come back with some green lights, some silver lining that we can move forward towards towards prevention. Thank you very much. Right, Adibesh, uh, you made very pertinent points uh, regarding vulnerability, difference between hazards and disaster risks. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Chakravarti, you have just finished, you heard Adibesh, uh, you have just finished a study, uh, UNDP MHA mega project on disaster scorecard and measuring risks and resi resi resilience of the states. Uh, I would like you to uh, deliberate upon uh, on three points. One, of course, what uh, your study uh, uh, throw, throw up the results, what kind of results that you uh, got in this study. And also, how do you balance between uh, development and environment? Animesh was talking about uh, unplanned urbanization. How do we make uh, cities more resilient to face a disaster? And what kind of mitigation measures be put in place to face a crisis situation? Dr. Chakravarti. Wide range of questions. So Onimesh so talked have, about- You have five minutes. Yeah. Onimesh talked about the H factor and the V factor, the hazard factor and the vulnerability factor. So I would like to add another factor, E factor, and that is the exposure factor. You know, exposure has two dimensions, exposure of the population and exposure of the economy. Now cities, as you know, that it has a very highly dense population, particularly in the developing countries. In India, for example, the average urban density is about 18,000 you know, people per square kilometer compared to about 2,000 in USA, 4,000 in UK, even 10,000 plus in China. And that urban density in some of the pockets in the city are even alarming. Dharavi slum area, for example, about 2,70,000 people living in one square kilometer area. So that means when there is you no know, a, a disaster happening, then it is too, much, too many people are getting exposed. So the level, the, the probability of injuries of dates and other things are also quite high in the city. And the second factor is the, is the, is the economic, economic factor. 
because the cities, as you know, these are producing almost 75% of the wealth of the countries, any country, in India also, the relative contribution of agriculture is declining. And so the cities, so if there is a disaster, you'll find in the cities, the level of damages would be enormous. For example, in Mumbai floods, you know, 2005, you know, uh, 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 you know, the extent of the damages were enormous. Similarly, it was in Sinagar flood or in Chennai flood or other areas, whenever it is happening. So the one important way how you mitigate this is that, that you have to also see that our wealth, our, our wealth, the economy is protected and also our people are protected. So these are very serious challenges because when you are calling of the exposure, it is the vulnerable people and the vulnerable assets in the urban areas that are getting exposed. So you have layers of vulnerability of the people here, you know, the people, the poor people living in slum areas, and then there are people who are aged people, people, children, the disabled people, and economy and the and the various aspects of the economy, like the infrastructure, physical infrastructure, for example, the housing, your your roads, your buildings, other things. You know, you find the airports, very, you know, newly developed airports, very nice looking. But you find the uh, little bit of cyclone and rain, you know, these are started, you know, Chennai airport, for example, during flood, it remained un you know, unoperational for about seven, seven days, which is not totally not acceptable. That means the infrastructure of the city, the, the physical infrastructure of the city is highly vulnerable. It is not resilient. So when you're talking of the resilience of the cities, we have to talk of both the physical resilience, the physical infrastructure of the city, which are like the bones, the bones, the arteries, and the muscles of the city. And also this resilience of the community and the community of the brains of the city, the community, how it is organized, the society, the economy, and all that. So we have to look at it in both sides, both angles. Now, the study that you're talking about, it was published recently, about, about a week, 10 days back. But the study was completed almost two years back. It was a study not on the city, but it was a study on measuring the risks and the resilience of the states in the of India, and that includes the, the cities also. So basically, what we what we what we start, wanted to do is that, that we wanted to, to measure the measure the risks of the of of the, of, of India. So and the, and the, so we took the age factor. There are hazards. We took about fourteen hazards. Twelve of these are natural hazards. Two of these are man-made hazards. Then we took vulnerability factors. The the, the vulnerability factors were also 14. The social vul the vulnerability, then the economic vulnerability, physical vulnerability, environmental vulnerability. And so we, we collected data on that. And then the exposure factor, of course, the economy and the population. So we collected this uh, data from all over India, involving all the scientific technical agencies, the statistical agencies, the, uh, the, uh, the Registrar General of India, the population data, other things. And also we collected enormous amount of data from the states. And, and then and based on a complex methodology that we worked with the Indian Statistical Institute, we gave weightage on certain hazards. Then we, we found what would be the relative, relative weightage of different hazards, very complex kind of system. Then we measured the risks of the, of the, of the states of India, of the districts of India, each districts we measured. and about 646 census districts that we did. So the risk part, I think, that was completed somewhere in December 2017. And the resilience part on which the data is not available. So what we did is that we developed an elaborate set of questionnaire, 182 questions, which is circulated to the state government. And it took us almost more, almost more than a year, more than a year to collect data from the states. A huge amount of data, which again, we developed a methodology for, for putting some kind of, uh, you know, uh, value and weights on those things, and we measured that, and we found the best performing states in India. It was scoring, you know, less than for 50 percent of in the resilience score. So in this, so in this scorecard, we found uh, that in risk part, the, the the more populated areas, more populated cities, because the exposure level was very high, and in the urban areas, the the risk factor was very very high, but the resilience factor is very low. That means we have done quite a lot in preparedness. Again, in the resilience also, we had seven broad indicators. You know, we had the risk assessment, risk prevention, mitigation, the risk governance, then you had this, you know, disaster response, disaster preparedness, then disaster relief, disaster recovery. So all these, on each of these were indicators. There were 70 indicators on which we tried to measure it. And we found that we have done some amount of preparedness, 
but lot of our risks are not yet prepared. So we have a level of residual risk. Residual risk in India is very high. That, that, that means risks which are neither, neither, neither prevented nor mitigated, but risks which are, which are left open, which are neither transferred. There's no developed risk insurance system. Mm -hmm. And so there is a level of residual, residual risk is very high. But uh, on some of the disasters, like in Cyclone, for example, we have done wonderfully well you know, to protect people. We have saved lives and we have done so, but we haven't done so well in flood. It is a recurring phenomenon and people are dying, which is not acceptable at all. And on earthquake, again, you know, no major earthquake, no major urban earthquake in India has taken place. But we have some major cities like in Assam, Guwahati, for example, Sinagar, for example. These are in, in the seismic zone five, but these are million plus cities. More than a million people are living. And we have created a scenario, you know, based on uh, the USGS and uh, United States Geological Survey, uh, you know, that, uh, that a similar kind of earthquake that, uh, that Assam had in 1950, it will be repeated today in 2020. What will be the level of damages? So damages will be enormous. So we are still not much protected from the earthquake side, there is particularly in the urban areas in, these, in the seismic zone. So there are lots to be done. We have done quite a lot in, risk, in disaster preparedness. But we have a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of work to be still done, and disaster response also to the risk response force and etc. We are saving lives, saving properties to some extent, no doubt. So we have made a remarkable achievement in some of the areas. But in the in the in the in the field of disaster prevention, uh, and in the field of in the areas of disaster mitigation, there are a lot of works which still remain to be done, particularly in the right, area. right, Dr. Chakravarti. Hold on to your thoughts. I'll come back to you again. Uh, Dr. Uh, Virupaksha Dekshit, you are located at Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti was talking about uh, the flood situation. Uh, we have seen in the last couple of years, even in this monsoon, uh, cities after cities gets flooded in two hours of rain or four hours of rain. Uh, we see boats on the streets because uh, people are stuck everywhere. And uh, recently, just four days back, we saw in Indore that people were rescued on boats because the city was completely flooded. I mean, you might be a clean city, but your preparedness to you know unexpected disaster, unexpected situation, crisis, uh, how do you see uh, our cities prepared your organization is practical action. How much practical action actually you see on the ground and in a disaster situation? The, we are talking about vulnerability. Which section is the most vulnerable? Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this webinar. <clears throat> and uh, if we'll see, like uh, you, are, you have rightly identified the cities are flooding like anything, when actually I was a kid, I have never seen my city uh, having any issues like this. But uh, with uh, passing of time, these cities in most part of India, even globally, you can see many cities are also uh, struggling with this flooding. The rain for one hour, two hours, then there will be uh, really uh, very challenging situation uh, uh, for the cities. And uh, mostly the city, uh, cities are vulnerable due to uh, many factors. You can see uh, the factors like the rapid growth and inadequate planning is one cause where because of this, the cities are uh, vulnerable to disasters. Then the population density in most of the cities and the unplanned growth of the city along with the population are putting more challenges. The ecological balance uh, in the city is not, uh, 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 is not, uh, in the right uh, direction. Then if you see why city people are mostly vulnerable because they have, they have more dependency on infrastructures and uh, service providers. You can say not uh, like uh, more dependency, it is actually over dependency. The city people are actually the parasites I used to say. We depend on others for everything. We don't produce anything, we, don't, we only consume. Uh, so our lifestyle has become like that in cities. Then cities has inappropriate constructions. And then if we'll see India in India, uh, if people don't, don't uh, take it otherwise, this concentrated political and economic resources in some path 
and the swamp parts are not getting those are the major reasons why the city has become uh, really uh, uh, vulnerable to disasters uh, water logging and uh, flooding particularly in bhubaneswar if you see i can give you a very small example like uh, as i said my city was not flooding my city was not having any water log issue but this is man made actually you can see now the uh, the outskirt of the cities has been encroached the rivers have been encroached and uh, the water bodies have been encroached and uh, people like uh, people are encroaching all the wetlands and there is uh, no proper drainage and even if you we'll see like uh, year after year actually the planners are increasing the heights of the road and uh, eventually by a 5 minutes 10 minutes rain the water will definitely enter your house making it a flood inside your house and uh, this is making like uh, people more vulnerable and if you see in the city uh, the swamp people urban poor sir the low income group people are actually mostly vulnerable group they because they their density is quite higher their settlement is informal and they rarely own any house and those houses are very uh, poor in like construction uh, and if you see like many informal settlements are located in uh, like uh, you can say environmentally vulnerable area we can say and uh, the services they used to get from the governments are not uh, quite enough for them that's why they became more vulnerable and the city administration and the city government even the state government i feel see the central government i don't see personally i don't see they are putting much effort much focus on issues like this they are very less at attention towards city flooding water logging uh, these have become the common phenomenon these have become the problem for everyone in rainy season and nobody is giving proper attention to that and this can be this can be actually controlled if the uh, like the proper steps are taken like uh, we we can encourage the development policies that reduce vulnerability like we can think of land use we can think of risk assessment you can think of disaster impact assessment and we can design construct and work on proper maintenance and integrate uh, many things pro properly and uh, if you see the city managers they need to learn how to cope with emergency situations that is lacking in many places and even if you put any complaint before like uh, occurrence of any disaster nobody is coming and taking uh, note of your issues and taking any giving any attention to that then community you think of the community community is not that aware and they are they have very less education people thinks from themselves only they don't think about the society as a whole i think people uh, bear lots of responsibility because of uh, for this kind of vulnerabilities and challenges which can be addressed properly and uh, there should be like special programs for high risk situations and uh, government should work on those that i am uh, properly uh, particularly thinking if actually we are not giving any proper attention to these these particular these areas then the city flooding and water logging is not going to stop and you know like cities are drowning cities are drowning in globally in many cities are drowning and if you see the example of cities like chennai maharashtra jaipur Uh, and even i added bhubaneswar uh, to this because i stay near to the airport near to the chief minister house and my locality faces the same problem also so you see like uh, the uh, like the pos areas the vip areas are also the vip cities are also struggling i think it is high time for government to look into this and if they are not looking into this then they are making the life everybody in city vulnerable and the city life is going to become hell and people will definitely we are afraid of to come down to city and think of a better life thank you right right dr dikshit uh, i'll come back to you again uh, before i go to mr vinid bhat and mr saldana uh, i missed the point to tell you that uh, those who are participating on zoom you can ask your question you can post your question on zoom post or at the end of second round of discussion you can wave your hand and ask your question directly to the panelists we are streaming live on facebook uh, you just have to open your facebook page and type urban update mag that is urban update m a g mr bhat you have been working uh, in uh, 
you are currently engaged in evaluating the humanitarian work of both UN and international non-governmental agencies on tsunami relief and rehabilitation. Uh, tsunami, of course, uh, how long do you think uh, the victims suffer uh, after a disaster like tsunami takes place or something like they lose in Bombay in two, uh, 2005, which had a very lasting impact on people of Mumbai. Your thoughts? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this very useful and timely uh, 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 webinar that you organized, Tananjan. Uh, bye. And um, your question about how long the victims suffer beyond once the disaster has taken place. And um, I'm very uh, uh, sorry to not give you a very cheerful and positive response because the fact remains that most of the things that we know about disasters, urban disasters in your case, as we are discussing that, is very limited to a narrow scope of a year, year and a half response and a relatively longer scope that is the analysis and the studies and uh, 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 um, other data analysis that is done in terms of predicting the hazard and therefore preparedness, etc. So basically we know about city and therefore the people who live within the city very less in terms of time span. Now, you are interested in two parts, resilience and mitigation. So what I did was I went back to look at um, some of the work that we have done, and which includes our work with UNDRR, United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, some 22 cities that we've looked at across India. And I went back to both the documents as well as called up people to find out what is actually happening. We looked at the long-term studies that we have done of the tsunami urban areas, Gujarat earthquake urban areas, and Kashmir urban areas as well, including the Kashmir floods and what happened to Srinagar. And we looked at, again, an urban, res uh, urban resilience report that we had done some time ago with Save the Children and uh, PwC to see what is happening as far as urban residents and children are concerned. So drawing from that, responding to your question, that what happens to the victims in the longer term, I think we leave after a maximum year, year and a half, and that is where the real recovery starts, and that is where the real uh, 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 struggle for both the citizens, the people, as well as the city, the authorities start. So for the local authority and the citizens, the real struggle to recover starts there. And if I can point out three or four areas where that struggle is very difficult, which we found from our work, I'm sure if there was a larger sample to look at, it would come up with maybe the same or maybe different. One area where there is um, a lot of uh, 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 struggle is that most of our disaster, under sorry, most of our understanding of our cities is very limited to the cities as they are and as they were in the past. But cities are changing very rapidly. In last three years, cities have changed 10 times more differently than in last 10 years. So that dynamic change and quantum change in the cities, we haven't grasped yet. And that is something, a major area, and therefore people who live within the city. Second major change that we see is that we look at disasters in terms of the hazards that we know, such as floods, cyclone, earthquake, tsunami you mentioned. But there are new hazards which we haven't looked at, or new hazards which are coming up such as COVID-19, a pandemic, obviously we all are aware, but also heat wave, for example, pollution that causes disastrous impact, so it's not disaster per se in some people's mind, and so that is another area. So those are the two areas where 
um, the impact unfolds much slower. And to sum up the last other two areas, are the areas where the resilience, as we know, in urban areas, urban resilience, is very much based on what we think is going to get you back to the previous situation of the city and previous situation of the citizens. And that is not what we want at all. What we want is a transformation, a change, a quantum change. So resilience per se has advantages, but very limited advantages as far as our India's needs are concerned. And mitigation, there is a National Disaster Management Act and Dhar Chakravarti Sahib has worked on that. There is a mitigation fund to be set up. We don't know at what stage it is. Perhaps the, the act is being reworked on. But the mitigation, which is reducing the loss and damage that cities face, and that part also needs to be looked at more carefully if we want to see what happens to citizens per se. Um, when we have next chance, uh, in terms of questions, I'd like to focus on what is it that cities can do so that three or four concrete areas, so that we move ahead. But maybe right. that will do in the second round. Right, right, so to right. sum up the response, this, we re really know very little about what happens to citizens in urban areas in the long term. Thank right, you. Right, right, right. Uh, well said, uh, Mr. Bhatt. Uh, Mr. Saldana, sorry to keep you waiting for uh, long. Uh, you heard the speakers. You have been uh, the, uh, in the public uh, dealing with the lo local governments, local uh, elected uh, representatives, uh, administration. Uh, you have focused keenly on securing social and environmental justice. While dealing with these issues, what are the challenges that you face on the ground? And uh, how do you see, uh, even in cities like Bangalore, where you are present right now, are facing multiple challenges? Uh, your thoughts. Uh, thank you, uh, Dhananjay, and uh, thank, thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, I basically would like to start by saying, having heard all the other presentations, I'd like to start by saying that uh, cities were constructed on the presumption that they operate at uh, higher orders of efficiencies. But what we are increasingly waking up to the, is the fact that they are uh, uh, you know, basically exposed to higher orders of risks, not just make, uh, merely because of the densities uh, that cities pack in terms of human population, but, is, but also because of the way, way in which cities are built and operated, not just built, but also operated. And uh, overall, I think uh, cities have become extremely centralized uh, beasts, uh, especially in South Asia, and particularly in India, where uh, the whole idea is not to listen to wisdom, but listen to what comes from above. And uh, this is causing a great higher order of risks as well. And I'll come to the way in which smart cities are setting us up. For instance, Gurgaon got flooded last week, one of the so-called smart cities. So what's really smart about that is a big question. But before I get into that, I just want to quickly run through a few slides, if I can uh, share my screen and... <clears throat> yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh, it should work now. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try and uh, make it full screen uh, so that you can see it. Uh, I'm not able to make it uh, full screen. So let's go with that. Uh, yeah. So I'm just showing you some uh, images of Bangalore. Now, this is a very well-developed neighborhood known as Sadashinagar. The super rich live there. Uh, the most influential people, including the top uh, politicians live here. So you can see in the layout of this particular neighborhood that uh, pretty much everything is organized uh, for a comfortable and risk-free life. Whereas this is, a, uh, this is a neighborhood which has come up just next to the electronic city in Bangalore. And this is where most of the working classes live. And this did not come up 40 years ago, 60 years ago. This came up in the last 15 years. And it is packed with uh, people in small houses and for instance, pandemic uh, breaks out here and that has broken out and it has cost heavily uh, uh, for the poor people who live here. So this is the problem of the divided city which we are uh, increasingly creating. It's also divided because of the nature of decision making. Uh, this is a collection of photos of people who are the elite of Bangalore. It includes uh, IT, BT, 
political. Uh, this man uh, recently passed away is a mafia don, is a major builder, a good friend, and a film actor, and of course, this is a, a very senior bureaucrat. Opposed with these people who don't have any chance in uh, creating the city that they want uh, to function for them as well, because they also have an equal right. Uh, so this division is what is playing out across every city in India and perhaps across the world as well. And we are increasingly set up for greater disasters because of the mega cities that we are building. Now, for instance, uh, this is a scenario in Bangalore. Now, a similar scenario is being created in Kochi, where a similar bridge is being built toward, into an island which will be filled with petrochemical complexes. Now, suppose a flood took place and the flood resulted in a cataclysmic series of events resulting in the explosion of the cotton spears which hold the LPG gas in the island, people who are packed on this will all be incinerated in no time. And that, that will happen so fast that nobody can control it. Now, the point is that there are risks. For instance, the, uh, the oil fields explosion tell us something that when you build against the nature of chemicals or build against the nature of local environment, uh, things won't last. But we don't care to listen. And yet we continue to build as if building over everything seems to solve our problem. Now, what it does also is, for instance, this is not, uh, I mean, these are people sleeping last year in Delhi. And uh, this is a photograph which showed how they sleep. Now, we, we don't, don't build Delhi uh, for these people. They have to somehow manage to find a place to sleep in the cold winter, and this is how they sleep. Now, this is a perfect example of how, you, how we can spread pandemics, right? Uh, so we have just become a very insensitive uh, people uh, as we move along. Uh, in our cities. And uh, this is the image of Bangalore from 1973 to today. And you can see the increasing red. That means hardly any green cover is left in the city. What does that mean in terms of numbers? We have, we have uh, paved, uh, increased the paved area by about 1000% compared to 40 years ago. Uh, and in terms of the, for every 500 people, there is one tree in the most densely populated areas. When it is healthy for each person to have at least eight trees in terms of not just the fact that you know it produces oxygen and you use it and so on, but also the fact that there is a silver atmosphere that keeps you healthy. Uh, these are critical aspects which we are now waking up to uh, because again of the pandemic. But uh, uh, this is another way to see what happens to depletion of green cover. Uh, this is how it happens. The sparrows disappear. This is actual uh, pictures I took about uh, 10 years ago of uh, clear filling of farmlands uh, to create uh, expansion of Bangalore, forest disappear, and uh, heritage value, all of that goes. Uh, so the, po the point is that when you build cities like this, what are you building it for? As it, show as it shows here that Bangalore is basically sucking itself dry. And this is an image from five years ago. It's far worse now. And uh, this is another way to understand the same thing, that this is uh, one of the valleys of Bangalore. We have three valleys uh, which uh, drain the water out. And this is a huge lake. And you can see that everything around the lake is being built and the area of the lake is coming down. Uh, and this is the result of that. Uh, so when you build into watersheds in urban areas, you're basically building against, uh, uh, you know, the natural uh, uh, terrain, natural uh, processes, and you set yourself up for disasters. Now, this is the most unintelligent way to live. And yet we continue. This is the same valley. From another perspective, we can see how much of the drainage area has been built up. So obviously, even a small rain will lead to a flood, and we are having increasingly intense rainfalls in very short periods of time, resulting in flooding and massive destruction and loss of people. Uh, now, this is a photograph of the city and its interland, and each dot here is a lake system, and each lake is linked with another lake. And this lake series is what kept this region alive for thousands of years. Uh, communities have prospered here. It has been an highly urbanized uh, area for almost 500 years. And that's because whatever people got as rain was harvested intelligently. And this wisdom goes back to 5,000 years to the Arapan civilization, when not only did they bring water through harvesting rain through the structures, but they also took it away in a very sanitary manner uh, through underground drainage systems. Now, these are simple things to do. These are normative things to do for any, uh, uh, any sort of uh, urban living. But what we instead do is this is an imagination of the, uh, uh, Darabi now, uh, where they are saying Darabi slum should get out, and we will come up with all sorts of you know landmark this landmark that, and we'll segregate the industrial from the residential, from the commercial. We'll expand the value chain. So who are these people who actually project these imaginations onto Darabi? And we must know that Darabi, for instance, survived the COVID pandemic because of the community cohesion. Was the community consulted? 
in terms of this type of projection. So this is also very important to understand when you build cities like this. And obviously, there are people don't know that this is happening to them. Yeah. Why I'm sharing all this is because in the constitution, we have a very clear premise that we have to ensure that any community resource is controlled by the community so it subserves the common good. So if you really want to attack, uh, you want to build cities which are resilient and which are equitable and which are not uh, set up for disasters, I think this is one uh, prescription in the constitution which has to be ingrained. If I have a minute more, I'll complete, otherwise I'll wait. I'll, I'll come back to you, uh, sure. Leo. Uh, because uh, we have to go for the second round of uh, sure. a discussion. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Animesh, uh, you talked about South Asia, India in particular, but given the UN agency that you are working for, though with a responsibility for Asia and Pacific, but I would like you to uh, you know, uh, take you to uh, at a global stage. Uh, presently, uh, California is, is raising with fire. Uh, we saw what happened in Australia last year. Uh, and there are numerous examples, even Southeast Asia, in South Asia, uh, which are not always, quote unquote, uh, nature's fury, but they are as well man made disasters. As as well. Uh, what does one do about that? What is your prescription? What is how UNDRR is advising governments on that? Yeah, uh, let me, uh, thanks for this question. And I think uh, we are now moving into the solution part of uh, the problem at hand. Right. Um, and while responding to this, let me also reflect upon a couple of questions from raised from the participants as well. I see some two very excellent questions posed by Abhishek and Shruti. Uh, so in, um, I'm also responding to those questions while right, providing. Right, right, please, yeah. Um, I think uh, there are some few key uh, movements which are going on, which are, I think, very positive movements. One is in context of, and that partially addresses the question posed by Abhishek, is in context of uh, the whole discussion on infrastructure resilience. Um, we know that 60% of the infrastructure that will be that needs to be there by 2030 to cater to the needs of urban population has not yet been built. And this is a huge opportunity for us to ensure that the new infrastructure which is being created in all the urban centers across the world is risk informed. And that's a new paradigm we are talking about. Um, both uh, Mr. Mihir Bhatt, but also uh, Dr. Chakravarti also talked about the way that we need to move towards the prevention aspects of it. Dr. Chakravarti talked about that we have enhanced our capacities for preparedness, but not much has been done about prevention. And that comes from the global uh, analysis as well. We are aware of the, the predecessor of Sendai framework was the Hyogo framework. And when we did the analysis of the evaluation of the Hyogo framework in 2015, we found that over the last 10 years, between 2005 to 15, the governments have invested a lot into disaster management structures and into preparedness mechanisms, because of which, in general, for most hazards, the mortality rates have declined. But at the same time, the economic losses have increased dramatically. And we don't even have all the data as of now. But with the data we have, we can say with high level of confidence that the economic losses have been increasing. Now, infrastructure it attracts a lot of investment. We uh, have been doing our analysis, including as part of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure led by the government of India. And uh, it's found that around $93 trillion will be invested in the next 20 to 30 years into infrastructure. This is a huge opportunity. If we make this new infrastructure based on information to th gather through risk information and risk analysis, we can ensure that the disasters of tomorrow can be prevented. And disaster resulting from earthquakes, disaster resulting from, uh, from floods and other hazards which impact infrastructure. Um, how can we do this? One simple way is that a lot of information is collected by the insurance agencies, by the governments, by different technical organizations and governments on the risks which are present. But much of this information is not shared. And because in absence of the risk disclosure, we can't put a price tag to the risk that we are trying to address. And risk disclosure is followed by risk pricing. Unless we bring these two together, we will not be able to take the right action. So for example, let's take the case of real estate. 
so much of the spurt of infrastructure growth is happening because of real estate. And I'm sure all of us have bought some form of a property in urban centers in the country. How many of us have gone to the real estate developers and asked them, please show me the risk register or the risks which are present in the area where this construction has happened? Nobody does it. And it is definitely in the interest of the real estate developers that they don't share this information because this has an implication on the price of the building. Unless we develop this interest and ask the question that we need, you need to disclose the risk that how much of risk are we taking by buying this property, we will not be able to address the risk that we are trying to absorb and share by buying a property which is risk prone. It's as simple as that. So risk disclosure and the inf infrastructure being based on risk analysis and risk information is a single most opportunity. Let me expand that to town planning level. Um, a few years back, we heard a story from uh, Amravati, the new uh, capital being developed uh, in Andhra Pradesh. Um, a lot of construction had started happening and then it was found that it is the entire area is in a place where the floods will become very recurrent and very frequent. Um, it will have a huge impact on the populations. Why was this found after the construction and billions of dollars had already been spent? Perhaps this could have been prevented had we done the right risk analysis to ensure that appropriate measures needs to be taken when the construction goes on, when we de design the town, so that we don't face the disasters for the future. So disasters of the future are in our hands. And if we base our action using the risk information that we have at hand, we, will, we can prevent them. That's a very simple thing that, uh, that's a key point I'm trying to make. Um, moving on towards a second part in terms of addressing some more issues that perhaps is not so complicated, but with some simple measures, we can address them. For example, and that brings me to the question that Shruti has asked actually, is in context of how do the macro level climate change and micro level actions on town planning meet in context of climate change? Very good question. I think uh, there are limits to adaptation and we have to accept that. After a certain level, we can't keep adapting to the changing climate and hence the greenhouse gas emissions need to be brought down. And for that to happen, the Paris Agreement has to succeed. The withdrawal by countries, including by the US, doesn't help. So it's a global responsibility and that's at a macro level, the GHG emissions need to be brought back. Um, I was in the beginning talking about the reduction of around 10% in GHG emissions from 2019 to 20 because of COVID. I think that's a golden opportunity and if we can maintain this trajectory, we can reduce the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 on the climate change and ensure that mitigation becomes the more paramount important thing rather than adaptation because there are limits to adaptation. Now, having said that at the micro level, what use needs to happen is applying, and I think Dr. Dixit was talking about it, in context of uh, the nature-based approaches, the nature-based solutions, the ecosystem-based approaches and wetland management in the urban centers so that we can grow and we can build with nature. And there are very good examples across the, across the region, including, for example, in my own city here in Bangkok, it's based on a network of canals because each of the canal is absorbing the flood risk from the Chow Phraya River. Now, it goes on to say that in 2011, we had a huge flood, but that was because the hazard overwhelmed the capacity of the city. In general circumstances, despite being in a very rain, uh, uh, high rain area in a tropical city in the country, floods are not a normal thing in happen because of the wetland based structure that the city has uh, developed. Same goes in the series of more than a dozen spawn cities being developed in China. They're all based on a green infrastructure because they can absorb the excess water which comes through the floods. So if we build with nature, we can do a lot of adaptation to the changing climate and other hazards so that uh, the cities can, can prevent the disasters from happening. So we will not be able to stop all the hazards, but if we take the appropriate measures, reduce our vulnerability, reduce our exposure, we can reduce the, we can reduce the disasters of the future. I mentioned about, and finally, that's my last point, in context of solid waste management. Let's look at Singapore, the way even a small corn, which is not, it's not going to the waste. So if we recycle and if we approach the circular economy way of developing cities, perhaps a lot of things that can 
cause disasters in the future, in particular floods, for example, we can do it simply by doing a good solid waste management. Um, and perhaps that will uh, reduce our exposure and the vulnerability that we often face this, that results in disasters. Um, I will conclude by talking about a few tools that we have developed and might be of use. Um, 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 among the panelists, uh, Mihir Bhai and uh, Dr. Chakravarti both have also been contributing to the process and also been using our tools. Dr. Chakravarti, Dhar, the work that he did was one of the key contributions to the global assessment report that was he contributed to through a contributing paper, which was released last year. Now, we have been uh, developing and implementing a campaign called Making Cities Resilient Campaign for the last 10 years, from 2010 to 20, and four and a half thousand cities have joined this campaign. When they join the campaign, the city authorities commit to implementing the 10 essentials of city resilience. I will not go into the details, but in the process, a series of tools have been developed so that the cities can assess their level of risk and take corrective actions towards the path of resilience. Having gained the experience for the last 10 years on making cities resilient campaign, next in two months from now, we are going to launch the next generation of making cities resilient. It's called as MCR 2030. And MCI 2030 will take forward this advocacy into implementation. It will serve as a marketplace where the city authorities, the stakeholders in the city can approach us, approach MCI 2030 online dashboard and seek support. And we'll have service providers, including from the private sector who can provide support. And we bring the demand and supply together at this marketplace so that as we move forward, the success stories that we have received from multiple actions, including in the Indian cities, can be replicated across different cities in India and across the world. So right. I will conclude with this. Thank you very much. Animesh, thank you very well said. Uh, I'll take this to Dr. Uh, Chakravarti. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti, Animesh talked about that we do not seek information about the risks when we go and buy a property or we start a new project. We talked about Amravati. Uh, how do you look at it? Is it a policy failure that government is not able to uh, impose and ask various stakeholders to reveal the information? We are running out of time. Two minutes, Dr. Chakravarti. We have a lot of policies, a lot of acts. It is basically governance failure that we have not been so good in enforcing those laws and those acts. We have the regulations, we have the building bylaws, we have the zoning regulations, planning regulations, etc. But we have seen that how, uh, you know, these are followed mostly in violations. You know, as per an affidavit submitted before the Delhi High Court, you know, almost 90% of the constructions of Delhi are unauthorized, being the capital city. So this has been the pattern more or less everywhere. So we have now a lot of new developments are taking place in the public sector and mostly in the private sector, you know, which are following the facade of regulation, etc. But in practice, these are not being followed. So new risk, new level of risks are being created. And on the, on the, on the other hand, we have the accumulated risks. That means the houses infrastructure already built in the past, which are not as per the you know, regulations. So how to do this? How to retrofit our existing structure? So these are also challenges. So these are you know these are huge governing governance challenges, and that's why that is one of the reason you know the risk governance was highlighted as one of the key issues of the uh, key issues in the new uh, you know Sendai framework, and it is one of the priorities action, one of the four priorities action that you might you know assess the risk, you might even invest on risk mitigation. But un unless your risk governance is very good, then you are not going to achieve this. And the risk governance also is a very complicated thing. It is not, governance doesn't mean the government only. The government governance means the participation of all these stakeholders, all these stakeholders, including the community. The huge awareness creation so that the people demand the governance. So governance is not supply driven. You know, people have to be aware and demand of it. Just as Anime said that when you're buying a property, you are asking, you know, what is the level of risk of the property? So if that sort of, uh, you know, awareness is created among the consumers, okay, we have a right to be, to live risk-free and we have to, we have to demand that. So then only the, you know, the stakeholders will be forthcoming with that. So here also, I think that there is a lot of, lot of work to be, which 
which remains to be done. So there are so many other issues, but your time is very limited. So I'd like to finish. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti. Uh, Dr. Dekshit, uh, you work on the ground. Dr. Chakravarti was talking about that we do not demand governance, which does, just does not mean from the government, from the local authorities, elected representatives and all. That completes the chain of governance. You work on the ground. What is the practical solution you think is available and should be practiced? <clears throat> You see, uh, the practical solution it mostly depends, as Dr. Chakravarti said, the governance is the major challenge. Like how to advocate for all these things to with the governance, like how they we can make them more sensible, how we can make the city planner more responsive. Those are the areas where actually we should work, along with building the knowledge and capacity of the community. Community also plays a very major role, as I said in my previous uh, uh, question answering by the previous question. So uh, for the governance, particularly, as I said, like practical action, we are demonstrating few things like how uh, infrastructures can be uh, created as per plan, how like water can be managed, how we can harvest the excess rainwater. Those are actually we are demonstrating a bit, which actually in uh, collaboration with the government, so as they can, uh, they can uh, like uh, replicate the successful models in other places. Besides that, actually, we are creating major awareness among the community. So the community can be responsive to the emergency situation. And uh, that, that I say, like, that primarily hold uh, a major role. Like, uh, interestingly, uh, I will say, like, once Mahatma Gandhi has uh, said, like, there is enough in the earth for everybody's need, uh, but not enough for everybody's greed. So how we can make people, like, more responsive? That is, and how we can make the administrators, the policy makers, the uh, government people more responsive and uh, how they can look into uh, the uh, like proper plans and how they can design the city properly and execute it accordingly. Right? That is another challenge, like I said, like uh, we have a proper design, we have everything, but we don't follow that. So those awareness and education educations are the real thumb rules, if most of the organizations at the ground, they work on that, then I think a few things can change. I will cite a very small example. That I said, like, year after year, the government is increasing the heights of the road in every locality. Okay. And what happens out of that? The buildings which are constructed 10 years, 15 years back, they are actually uh, going down to the road level and water is entering your house. So this is a very simple, small kind of issue which can be addressed properly, but nobody looks into that. Neither people react to that, neither the policymakers think about this, neither the executor while doing this, they execute this. So if you have, you can identify the real challenges among the community, among the cities, and you can take it to the proper people, to the policymakers, then I think we can definitely get solutions. Right. There are solutions and we can definitely address the man-made disasters completely that I personally feel. Right, right, right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mihir Bhatt, uh, there is a question. I will put it to you. I think uh, you will be able to certainly answer this question. Uh, the question is from Wangda Dorji. Uh, the question is, cities are increasingly uh, reclaiming more lands and flood plains to accommodate more people, thereby increasing the exposure to future uncertainty. Is there an appropriate model or size of a city that is more resilient? Mr. Bhatt, two minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Dorji, for this question. And um, I fully understand where is it coming from, having known a little bit about uh, uh, the background of urban planning that is taking place. I think I'd like to build to answer to this is to build on what Animesh Kumar mentioned is about the solid waste management, about the urban economy and basically circular cities that we are able to look at. If we are able to circular the use of various materials and products and services, the size to keep on expanding 
maybe less and less. So that is something which needs to be looked at a bit more carefully. Also, um, uh, Dikshitji mentioned that you know he comes from a long tradition of long, a uh, long tradition of small is beautiful background, and practical action has a series of measures that they have suggested which will actually reduce the size of urban uh, um, areas, not only in terms of geographical expansion, physical expansion, but also the economic expansion that cities become so large, they keep on extracting from the surrounding region, surrounding cities and surrounding countries as well. So I think some sort of an audit of urban investment new investment that's coming in urban areas would be very good to see it from the resilience point of view, audit it from the mitigation point of view, that how this additional investment, public and private, in this particular area is going to affect the size of the city, size of the city economy, and how it will affect the overall ecological balance around the city. So that's the direction uh, uh, I think Dorji uh, uh, we think we would be going. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bhatt. Uh, Mr. Saldanha, uh, there is one last question and I'll put it to you because you are, we're talking about uh, Bangalore, Bengaluru, as we call it now. And this question is from uh, Arun uh, Pial. Uh, the question is, our cities have been planning for long how do you think the city planning and enforcing the regulations play in uh, a role in building a resilient city? Saldana, two I think minutes. An excellent question because I think it also helps in summing up a very productive discussion. Uh, basically, I think Indian cities have been driven to with top-down decision making. Uh, though we had the promise of democratic and uh, ground-up uh, planning, uh, we threw it, uh, threw it away for almost six decades and woke up to it in the 1990s with the Nagarpalika Act. And though the act institutionalized uh, ground up planning, ground up governance, ground up administration, ground up risk planning and all of that, what we now see predominantly is the prime minister's office trying to tell us how to build our cities, especially the smart cities. Now the prime minister has a job to do, which is to manage the country. It's, it's not his job to decide how urban, uh, and there is a great diversity in this country. A city in uh, Nagaland is not a city in, Bang uh, in Karnataka. They have to have their own cultural histories, they have to have their own geographies, they have to have their own people, the uh, dialectics, the languages, linguistics, so many diversities are there that shape the outcomes. So basically, I think the only way we can move forward and resilient, uh, uh, build resilience in our cities is to ensure that people locally uh, reclaim the political power, the administrative power, the power of planning, which is vested in them by the constitution and do not actively listen to the dictums from Delhi or even Bangalore. Bangalore cannot decide what a local village should do or a local town should do. So that parastatal driven decision making has to be junked. That is what has created risk, increased the risk and created uh, and, and exasperated disasters. I have worked in predicting uh, the disasters of the Mangalore airport, unfortunately predicted the air crash 10 years before it actually happened exactly in the way it happened. Also work with the people in Chennai to tell them that that expansion in Chennai will lead to flooding, which happened. Work, didn't, couldn't work with the people in Koikod and that disaster happened. So, you know, people like us can all the time say that because of the past uh, experience, we can kind of make a logical framework analysis and project what, which way we are headed. If you look at all of our Indian cities, we're all headed for a very terrible situation. And you can't always wake up to it when a disaster strikes, be it a pandemic, an earthquake, a flood, or whatever else. So I think it's high time that we actually reclaim the power that is ours and do not allow people who are divorced from the reality to decide for us. And that, I think, is a way forward. And I also want to say that, finally, that uh, there is now a tendency to privatize profit and socialize risk. That has to end. We have to socialize profit. You cannot have 1% of the people who are so rich that they buy up most of the properties and reinvest and reinvest and rebuild and rebuild and build for what? 50 to 60% of the inventories in Bangalore are not lived in. So what are we building for? Who am I building for? Ghost towns have been created. And those ghost towns are based on mining out resources, building into floodplains, causing a devastation across the country. And we have corridors being planned like that. Just because people have money, that doesn't mean they have to de destroy this planet. And I think that's enough. We have gone through that enough. People are dying in millions today, every year because of disasters. 
due to this kind of fractured sense of politics that we have. So we need to come together politically, socially, ecologically, economically, and look at each other in a very humane way so that this ends and we have a better future in the future. Right, Sandana, uh, very well said that we must not uh, uh, pri privatize the profit and socialize the risk. Uh, it has been very, very uh, well, uh, good discussion on the topic of uh, disaster in cities and uh, the mitigation and resilience. Uh, we need to localize rather than having a top-down approach, we need to localize and let the people decide how they want to be governed, in which direction they want their town, their cities, their villages to go, rather than somebody taking a decision for them. It was an exhilarating discussion. Uh, for the moment, we all, that is all the time that I have. Uh, Dr. Animesh Kumar, Dr. Chakravarti, Mr. Bhatt, Dr. Tekshit, and Leo Saldanha. Thank you very much for joining on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be back next week, same time, with a new topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.